Hello everyone and welcome to Michelin Capital Markets Day. My name is Asha Sampat. I'm a journalist. I'm delighted to be here with you all today. We are live from Clermont-Ferrand and I'm not alone. Joining me on the set, we have Florent Menego on my right, the CEO of Michelin. Hello Florent, how are you? Hello Asha. Hello everyone. All right. And we have Yves Chapeau, who is the general manager and CFO. Hello Yves. Hello Asha. Right. It's good to be here today, but why are we here, Yves? Uh -huh. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so this Capital Market Day, which was initially planned in November last year, aims at updating you on our progress in deploying our 2030 Michelin in Motion strategy. And we're looking forward to learn more about it. So let me turn to, uh, to you, Florent. So the last Capital Markets Day was in April 2021. And at that time, if I remember, the growth strategy it was 2030 plan named Michelin in Motion was revealed. So today we're going to go through a little bit uh, have some update on the deployment of this strategic plan and together with members of the executive committee who will be here on the set uh, in a couple of minutes later on. So we will look at some of the highlights, the key topics in three fields of activity, which many of you know with Tyre, around Tyre and beyond Tyre. But before we jump in to uh, the heart of uh, the different topics, let's probably step back for a moment and look at what happened since 2021 and I'm sure a lot happened. What can you say, what were the main changes that have resulted from this very tough period? 2021 was only two years ago and so much has happened since then. Absolutely. Uncertainty and unpredictability have become the new normal. A good reason to regroup today uh, since our global environment evolved in so many unexpected directions and certainly at a faster pace than expected. Let me point out some of them. With recent events, we are now confronted with a new reality, the world fragmentation. New and enhanced geopolitical tensions or risks call in many cases for more local presence and reduced dependency across certain geographies. I would also highlight the deep change in the relation to work that has materialized in North America and Europe on top of workforce shortages for some specific jobs in some part of the world. All right, and uh, relating to the relation to work that you've mentioned, we can think about the truck drivers and industrial jobs as example of this great resignation. So you also mentioned some of the transformations that happened at a faster pace than you expected actually. Probably tell us which ones. The environmental awareness has dramatically increased uh, in the society, catalyzed by a recent succession of abnormal weather events. People everywhere around the world have experienced or witnessed very concretely major droughts, hurricanes, floods, etc. These multiple phenomena have called for faster actions, leading to new regulations. Think about the Green Deal in Europe or the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. Right. This rise in environmental awareness is also challenging corporations' CO2 emission reduction roadmaps. Uh, from another angle, the need to switch to 100% sustainable materials in our industry has become imperative. At the same time, this surge in environmental awareness has accelerated the electrification of mobility. Think about China in 2022. Almost 30% of new cars sold were electric, being BEV or hybrid. It's huge. Uh, I agree. And, and we can see these transformations, these accelerations in so many different industries. But how do these transformations impact your strategic plan, Mission in Motion? Concretely, it increases the necessity to deploy further our local to local strategy. It also reinforces our determination to grow around and beyond tire. I'm talking about services dedicated to fleets on one side mm -hmm. and high-tech materials on the other. Here, it is key to understand that our growth is directly nurtured by our Michelin distinctive capabilities. In services to fleets, uh, we leverage our unrivaled understanding of vehicle usage acquired through tire business. We enhance it by technologies such as AI, computer vision, etc. In high-tech materials, we leverage our deep mastery of material sciences and complex industrial processes 
to develop objects and engineered materials required for highly demanding applications in various domains, such as aerospace, healthcare, or other industries. All right, so it seems to me like the ongoing technological acceleration is clearly uh, shaping uh, your differentiation, if I may say. Is it, is it the right way to look at it? Yes, Sasha. Uh, we leverage technologies and science to increase our leadership and differentiate from competition, both in terms of performance and sustainability. The more the world requires long-lasting products made of more sustainable materials, the more Michelin's offer is relevant and the more our group has opportunities to grow. Right, so let's look at the financials in this context. So how, how, how do we read what happened in 2021 and 2022? Over the past two years, our group has released solid financial results. This is the best demonstration of the relevance of our value-creating strategy. Over 2021 and 2022, we have been able to offset record cost inflation of over 3.9 billion euro with a strong pricing discipline while further enriching our product mix and growing our non-tire activities. When we look ahead, we are on track to achieve our 2023 goals communicated during our 2021 Capital Markets Day, despite a very challenging environment. Right, so on track to achieve the 2023 targets, but now what about 2030 ambitions? You know, to grow your sales by an average of 5% a year and to reach the 20 to 30% of non-tire revenues. Part of our growth in the past five years was fueled by a dynamic M&A activity. Mm -hmm. We will continue with this momentum in the years to come to deliver our growth ambition. In the last five years, we've acquired several companies for over 4 billion euros. The main ones being Fener, Camso, Multistrada, and Masternote. We've also set up and developed three significant joint ventures, one in the tire space with TBC, our wholesale distribution channel in the US, and two in Beyond Tire with Solesis in healthcare and Sunview in hydrogen mobility. On top of that, when our vocation is not to hold the assets, we have leveraged our IP with many partners, such as Enviro, Carbios, etc. I think our track record is excellent. With these new businesses, uh, with these businesses' successful integration, we already see new developments resulting from innovation synergies. They are hitting markets now and increasing our differentiation. This gives us full confidence in the delivery of our growth strategy around and beyond tire while maintaining our leadership in tire. Fantastic. Thank you, Florent. Thank you, Yves. I'll see you later on. But right now, we move to uh, look at the other sessions with, uh, we welcome in a few seconds, Stock Scott and Eric in the With Tire session. And with me, joining me on the set, we have uh, Scott Clark, the VP for Automotive Businesses. Hi, Scott and Eric Vaness, the VP for Research and Development. It's great to have you both. Hello, Thank Asha. you. It's great to be here. Fantastic. So, uh, Florent just spoke about, he, he mentioned quite a lot of things, but one of the things that I, uh, I heard is about this all sustainable approach, which is really at the heart of what Michelin is doing business. I think, Scott, Tell us what, what it means in practice in the tire business itself. Sure, Asha. Uh, Asha. Uh, what Eric and I would like to share today is how we bring to life our all-sustainable approach as the foundation of our leadership in product performance and in our operations. Let me begin with passenger car tires. Obviously, the big revolution underway, and I spoke about it in our last Capital Market Day presentation, is the electrification of the vehicle park and the focus on all things becoming sustainable. <clears throat> Both of these inflections create a significant opportunity for Michelin. Electric vehicles are already an important part of our OE tire sales as we have nearly 300 OE, OE homologations across 55 brands. By 2025, we'll begin to see the impact of this OE business in the replacement market, mm -hmm. pulled by a significantly higher loyalty rate on electric vehicles compared to ICE vehicles, as we've seen in several consumer studies. 
Right, so EV, definitely a game changer in, in the sector. What, what does it imply for a tire maker? <laughs> well, Asher, we are uniquely positioned to benefit from the technological challenge created by electric vehicles on tire performance. Most of you know electric vehicles are more demanding on tires as they require low rolling resistance for battery range, along with durability and long wear life to withstand the extra weight and torque of an electric vehicle. The ability to deliver both of these performances simultaneously without trading off other critical performances is technically very complex and it's a key, key and clear differentiating strength of Michelin. This challenge is becoming increasingly visible to our OE partners and will be, become visible to BEV owners in the replacement market as well. Our testing across a wide range of BEVs shows that Michelin offers at least a 20% wear life advantage versus premium competitors while delivering industry leading rolling resistance. And this is a key reason why our OE share on BEVs is substantially higher than our ICE share. And within the premium sub-segment of BEVs that we target, our share is three and a half times higher than our average OE share. And as we add the demands of increased sustainability, such as higher levels of recycled content in our tires, it's gonna be even more difficult for many tire manufacturers to meet both the tire performance mm -hmm. and sustainability demands. This, once again, places a premium on Michelin's capabilities to do what we do best, which is to leverage our technological leadership to provide unparalleled performances without compromises. All right, so passenger's car. Now, what about road transportation? On the road transport market, as the global population continues to expand and the demand for goods increases, we'll continue to see market growth. We'll also see a strong global push to decarbonize road transportation through new regulations. Again, this inflection will play into our strengths and help us to create more value both for Michelin and our partners by bundling and exploiting our leadership in tires, connected services, and the circular economy. A recent example is how we've developed in partnership with major OEMs the Michelin X in-city EV tire for the rapidly growing European electric urban bus segment, which will quadruple in size between now right. and 2026. Our capabilities and strengths will help us create value by improving the uptime and operating cost of fleets while helping them achieve their sustainability objectives. Fantastic, very clear on the road transportation. Now, what about specialties tires? Probably, let's start with mining. Sure, Asha. For specialty tires, I'd like to really focus on two valuable segments, mining, as you mentioned, and agriculture tires. In mining, the huge need for EV batteries, solar panels, and fuel cells will increase the need for mineral and metal extraction by 25% in the coming years. However, there'll be a demand and a need to do that work with the highest sustainability standards. And once again, this is an opportunity for Michelin to reinforce our leadership in helping mines operate in the most efficient and the most sustainable way possible through our Michelin Better Mining approach, which bundles our product advantages with service and sustainability offers. Three great examples are the new 57 inch tire for dumpers, which is 100 kilograms lighter than the previous generation and offers the best ton per kilometer ratio in the market. The Michelin Specialty Materials Recovery Cutting and Shredding Facility in Chile, which will play a key role in helping recycle mining tires. And the success of MEMS, our connected mining tires, which help improve mine safety and effectively add three and a half days of increased productivity due to reduced downtime. Our MEM system is found in 60% of our mining tires in service today. And you mentioned agriculture, Scott. Absolutely. Uh, when it comes to agriculture, tracks are a great example of a successful acquisition for Michelin. Thanks to the acquisition of Camzo, Michelin is able to provide our customers with comprehensive premium solutions for both tires and track systems for tractors. The track segment is consistently growing at a 10% rate and is a brand new business for us, which offers major advantages in terms of environmental protection and productivity increase. The yield of a track is 5% better than a regular tractor while reducing soil compaction and allowing better access to the fields. 
This great business also resulted in synergies delivered one year ahead of our target. So it's a true acquisition success story. Fantastic, great to hear. And let me remind you that we will take a few questions after uh, this session with Tyre, but now let me turn to Eric. So Eric, tell me, how did you reach this level of performance? And technically, what, what does it mean? What, what did it take? Yeah, well, I shall have several levers I'd play here. First, we are doubling down on our research efforts to continuously increase our advantage in tire durability and very much in wear performance. So so as to reduce material consumption for the same but even better capabilities. These are areas where our material expertise has helped us establish a strong and historical leadership. For example, just over the past decade, we have filed over 300 patents covering entirely new generations of elastomeric materials with very unique performance attributes. And this effort is still going on, and we're still projecting, projecting it into the future. Um, and, it, it, and it shows. Uh, for example, as a result, we saw in the 2022 ADAC study that the Michelin passenger car tires, when compared to the average competitive set, uh, wears out 30% less rapidly than our competitors. And this is, of course, very important from several points of view. First of all, from an environmental impact, uh, but also from a competitive advantage standpoint. And, and it is especially true with the growth in BEV, battery electric vehicle, mm -hmm. that uh, being heavier uh, wear tires out faster, about 20% on average, more than mm -hmm. uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, ICs. Right, so I understand that wear performance is absolutely critical, but what about rolling resistance? Absolutely. This is a second very important component of uh, our environmental uh, impact. Uh, and it is an area where material expertise is also key to our leadership in sustainability. And this is because reducing rolling resistance has multiple benefits. Uh, it limits fuel consumption on C and CO2 emissions on ICE vehicles. But also, even for BEVs, it has a big effect because it impacts battery range directly. Now, over the past 20 years, uh, we have improved the energy efficiency of our passenger car and truck tires by more than 20% overall. And that's, of course, without any compromise on safety or the longevity of our products. And for our best performing products, those gains even go further, up to 40%. So there again, We've got hundreds of patents that have been filed for materials and reinforcing plies and complex metallic cables and textile cords that really distinguish our tires' efficiency and lightweight. And not only that, but we're also projecting ourselves in the future and we have committed that by 2030, we will improve the energy efficiency of our products by an additional 10% versus 2020. Great to hear. So quite clear, Eric, but how does this product performance apply to B2B? It also has very big applications in, in B2B. Today, more than ever, uh, our customers are looking to us to help them achieve, of course, more productive operations. That's, that's always been the case. But even more today, and they're also looking to us to help them reduce their environmental footprint. Let me give you a few examples. In truck, for example, the Michelin tire stands out for its reliability and its durability leveraging the Michelin casing that allows running up to 1 million kilometers. And that's thanks to its highest standard of robustness. The impact is very direct. Uh, it lowers the cost per kilometer by 40% and the use of natural resources by 70% if you take a recap tire compared to building a new tire. Finally, our pioneering work of the past 15 years in designing complex 3D features for our treads is enabling our truck tires to achieve drastically longer lasting performances. All these technologies put together contribute to improving overall performance while reducing downtime and maintenance operations for the fleets. So in summary, there's no doubt today that harnessing for good the significant changes that we see in the world around us requires distinctive innovation capabilities. And really, this creates tremendous opportunities for us, for Michelin to reinforce our leadership in developing sustainable solutions for our planet 
and through high technology material innovation. All right, but Eric, you mentioned the quantity of natural resources that are being tapped. What about the sustainability of those materials? Yes, this is a, a very important point. We are committed to delivering 100% sustainable material rates in all our tires by 2050. And we set an intermediate target for 2030 of 40%. And we're already in motion towards this achievement. But let me step back just a minute to give a, uh, a definition. At Michelin, when we talk about sustainable material, what we mean is a material that is recycled or biosourced mm -hmm. and that can be renewed over the lifetime of a human being. That's what we mean when we talk about sustainable, sustainable material. material. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're committed to integrating sustainable materials on a very large scale in all of our products while at the same time maintaining the outstanding product performance levels that, that are really unique to Michelin. And we're already showing concrete progress in that direction. And now beyond the sustainable material rate, how does sustainability translate into the life cycle of a tire? Yes, of course. Uh, sustainability and sustainable material rate is one part of a bigger equation, which is the life cycle analysis uh, of, of the tire. So we have to look at everything that goes into the creation and the use of the tire, starting with the sourcing of our raw materials, the production and the transportation of the tires, the performance of our tires while in use, uh, and even the end of life recycling. So we are embracing this notion of eco-conception based on life cycle analysis so that by the end of 2023, every new tire that will be starting in the development phase mm -hmm. will be eco-designed using a full life cycle impact analysis and reduction targets, of course. So we are continuously working on every component and every life stage of our tires in order to reduce our global impact on the environment for real and for the long term to make our tires truly all sustainable. And uh, there's lots of work to do there, but Scott, maybe uh, any other major stakes that we should be looking at? Yes, there certainly are, Asha. I'd like to talk about how we're leveraging technology, data, and digital solutions to really transform our industrial operations. And when I talk about transforming, it's really about helping us improve productivity, sustainability, and the experience of our employees. Several examples. We will nearly triple the number of robots we're using in our factories between 2021 and 2025. These robots will help us improve our cost competitiveness while improving the experience for our employees as we use robots to do some of the most physically challenging and difficult jobs. We're also increasingly using digital devices and sensors with more than 8,000 digital initiatives across our plants to increase productivity, anticipate machine maintenance, mitigate waste generation, and better monitor energy consumption, creating what we consider to be a win-win-win, better experience for our employees, improved cost competitiveness, and better energy efficiency as well. Over 10 years, we will realize hundreds of millions of euros of industrial gains thanks to the digital initiatives across our plants. Another great example is in the area of quality inspection. A process unique to Michelin is that we individually inspect every tire before it leaves our plant. This is a critical step in the process that, when done by a human, requires high concentration and very repetitive gestures. Today, more than 2,000 Michelin employees carry out this task. 15 years of research has enabled us to patent new technology that combines AI with 3D cameras allowing us to thoroughly, more reliably, and more efficiently inspect every tire. Again, thanks to this unique technology, we improve the employee experience while improving the end product for our customers. Oh, fantastic, quite impressive. Uh, we also hear about shifting curing presses to electric. I think that's important, right? Yes, Asha. Uh, technology in general is critical in helping us achieve our environmental objective of net zero emissions by 2050. Electric presses, as you mentioned, is a key technology that will help us reduce, reduce both CO2 emissions and energy consumption. The curing process today generates 25% of our total energy consumption. That's why we've been working on electric curing presses for 15 years and installed our first electric presses in 2013. Electric curing has an energy yield that is six to eight times higher than steam, generating 
two different benefits, reduced CO2 emissions and very significant energy savings. That's why we're accelerating our investments to electrify our curing presses with a priority on Europe. Actually, we're more than doubling our annual investment in order to capture more quickly the energy and environmental gains coming from this unique and patented electric press technology. Fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Eric. And I think we have a couple of minutes, of course, to take a few of your questions. So probably we'll start with this first one coming from all the way from Steve Pereira from Societe Générale. Hello there. You have a question? Let's hear it. Hi there, it's Steve from Top Jam. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Um, you mentioned a higher loyalty rate with um, Bev tires specifically. Could you maybe talk a bit more about that? Sure. Uh, we, we see already that, and consumers who own electric vehicles see already, that tires play a very critical role in the performance of the vehicle huge impact on battery life. We've talked about the fact that uh, electric vehicles consume tires at a 20% 20, 20 faster rate than an ICE vehicle. And so whether we talk about consumer forums, whether we talk about consumer studies that have been done, J.D. Power in the U.S., we see that uh, cons because consumers understand the important role that a tire plays in an electric vehicle, they tend to be more loyal to uh, the original fitment that came on that vehicle. And so that's clearly what we're seeing so far. Again, it's early days. Uh, remember, uh, electric vehicles represent uh, about one and a half percent of the total population of vehicles in the world today. So we're still learning, but all indications so far is that certainly there's a higher loyalty rate mm -hmm. uh, 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 on electric vehicles. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, thank you for that question. Next question, Philip. Uh, Koenig from Goldman Sachs. Uh, hello there. Um, you know, you're mentioning sort of the use of sustainable materials. Um, what are you hearing from your customers? Are they putting it off preference? Because clearly they also have their internal uh, targets of obviously moving towards carbon neutrality. Um, I'm just wondering if that sort of gives you an edge um, when you're having some discussions uh, about the contracts with your customers in, in the mining and ag space. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, uh, great question. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take it and then, Eric, you might want to add to it. But clearly, yes, we are, we are seeing our customers, particularly our OE customers, uh, who are, it, the whole world is awakened to the importance of sustainability and sustainable materials. So, yes, there's tremendous uh, focus on that today. Quite honestly, I think everyone's still trying to uh, align on definitions and standards and so forth, so there's still a lot of volatility. But clearly, what we know and what Eric explained, our leadership in materials and our position and our leadership in sustainability, all the trends we're seeing play in our favor. And uh, we think that this will increasingly be a point of differentiation for us, given our material expertise, Eric. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Scott, that's, that's correct. What, uh, what we've seen is, you know, we started working on sustainable materials quite a long time ago, well over 10 years ago. Uh, we started working on butadiene, for example, which is, you know, petrol source today, but that we're looking at projecting to, uh, to transform to biosource. Uh, and at the time, really, there was not much activity outside of us. And, uh, even three years ago, when we announced our uh, commitment to reaching 100% sustainable material rate by 2050, um, not many people were, were seemed to be into this. But but over the past three years, we've seen a huge acceleration, uh, and all the knowledge and the work that we've accumulated over the past 10 years put us really in a good position to answer that that need that is growing uh, extremely fast. Mm -hmm. And if I could just add one other thing that, that Eric mentioned, the, the life cycle analysis that we do now. Yeah. when developing our products, it, it, you know, that's very valuable to our customers. So they understand the end-to-end -end impact mm. of what we've designed and what we're bringing to them as a, as a product. Oh, brilliant. Uh, next question, Michael Jacks, Bank of America. We're listening. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, perhaps just touching on um, what was mentioned earlier in terms of the synergies for the CAMZO acquisition being delivered one year ahead of schedule. Are you perhaps able to provide any sort of quantitative metrics on that? I know when the business was first acquired, um, it was making revenue of about $1.2 billion a year and I think about $100 million in EBIT. Um, are you able to give us a sense for how this has progressed since the time of acquisition? Thank you. 
Well, in terms of quantitative, I, I'm not the, probably the best best Person. equipped to do that, but I can certainly talk about um, you know where the synergies have come from. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a lot of synergies, both in terms of how we go to market, uh, sharing our sales organizations, integrating our sales organizations, in terms of product development, uh, in terms of materials and so forth. So we've seen commercial go-to-market synergies. We've seen, obviously, purchasing synergies and uh, development and manufacturing synergies. And so we're excited the fact by the fact that we've realized those synergies a year earlier than we originally had anticipated. Yeah, and we've really been able to uh, put our knowledge on, on our development side and our material side to raise the performance of, of the products with uh, very strong tier two products uh, today. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to both. We have another question from Sanjay Bhagwani from City. Hi, uh, thank you very much for taking my question also. Uh, I've got two questions as well. Uh, the first one is, uh, is on, on the EV tires. Maybe could you please provide some color on what the price gap between the EV tires uh, has been for, let's say, like around three years ago when OEMs were just starting with the EVs versus what it is now? And how uh, sustainable do you think the price gap between EVs versus convention engine uh, looks for the next three to five years? Uh, that's my first question. Great. Yeah, I would say, you know, over three years, we haven't seen a dramatic shift in the price of EV tires. I think, if anything, quite frankly, you know, uh, OE customers and consumers, there's still a lot of learning that's going on about EV vehicles, their impact on tires. And quite frankly, I think that, if anything, we'll see the price gap grow as people understand how critical the role is of the tire. The fact that uh, EVs, consume tires at a 20% faster rate mm -hmm. than, um, than an ICE vehicle. The fact that, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think both the, the, and the rolling resistance impact that you can have when you change tires. And I think uh, as both the OEs become honestly uh, more attuned to that and the end consumer, I think if anything, we'll be able to differentiate even more our leadership and valorize it even more than we do today. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot more learning that's going to take place over the next uh, three or four years uh, when we see the, the size of the, the EV business uh, grow. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott, for that insight. Uh, next question, Ross McDonald from Morgan Stanley. Yes, thanks very much for, for taking my question. Um, you've made, you have a commendable lead, I should say, in terms of uh, tire abrasion uh, performance versus your peers. I'm just curious if you feel there's a lot more scope uh, for gains in, in that sphere. And then in addition, whether there is uh, any challenges with bio-based tires in terms of tire abrasion characteristics um, that, you, that you may want to call out at this time. Thank you. Yeah, so um, two, two, two points there. Uh, yes, there's a lot more to be gained in terms of uh, improvement in terms of the abrasion rate of, of tires. We're already working on the next generation of technologies. The, the fact that we are integrated uh, Amstream doing and developing our, our research on our own elastomers give us a key advantage there in terms of bringing solution that can really make a breakthrough, providing the benefits in terms of abrasion, but at the same time continuing, continuing to progress on rolling resistance and, and all the other performances of the, uh, of the product. Now, going to a sustainable material, mm -hmm. uh, basically our approach is to look for biosource materials and recycled materials that are in nature able to bring, the, to maintain the performance of our product or help us improve it. So uh, this is why it's very important that the research that we started again 10 years ago has been focused on identifying what are the right technologies that will allow us not only to, uh, to, to replace the, the current materials, but to do it while preserving the Michelin very strong performance uh, differentiation that, that we have and bringing all the benefits to, to our customers. All right, maybe we have time for one final question. This time we take a question from Christoph Laskawe from Deutsche Bank. Hey, thank you for taking my question. Um, there will be one on the uh, supply chain for sustainable materials. Will that be a local for local approach if possible? And do you expect uh, the improved share or higher share of sustainable materials to simplify supply chains overall going forward? Thank you. 
Well, it's going to be different. Uh, and of course, because we're talking about waste, uh, the best way to use waste and recycle waste and, and valorize it is going to be working, uh, working locally. But clearly, it's going to be a change with new supply chains uh, emerging, uh, new ways uh, to, to work upstream, new ways to valorize this waste. And, and, and basically, it's going to be a big transformation. And that's why the 2050 uh, target, even though it sounds like it's, uh, it's far away, uh, it's such a large and deep transformation that's uh, go ahead of us uh, that it, it is a realistic uh, target to get the whole uh, ecosystem to move in that uh, direction. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the great questions and thank you, Scott. Thank you. And we will move to our next session around tires as we welcome Lorraine Frager. And Eric is still there with me, and we welcome Lorraine Frege. Lorraine, you are in charge of Around Tire Businesses, as well as the strategy and innovation for the group. So for me, and I think for many people, um, Michelin means tire. So while you claim to have this legitimacy around tires, probably just give us some flavor, put some color around it. What does it mean? Absolutely, Asha. Well, you know, I often get the question of uh, whether Michelin has turned into a software company or is developing <laughs> autonomous vehicles. We're not. But we have definitely chosen to play in fields where our historical know-how makes us extremely relevant. Um, let's remember that we at Michelin, we've been delivering services to our customers for more than a century now. And we've been understanding how fleets operate daily, how vehicles and tires are used, how vehicles are maintained, and finally, what keeps roads and drivers safe. And thanks to this unique know-how about usage, uh, we are developing today a suite of solutions that puts digital capabilities at the service of fleet's daily operations, whether they simply need emergency road assistance, tire services like mechanical repair, or whether fleets want a tire as a service contract, or whether they choose to entrust us with a more sophisticated range of sensor-based services that bring them insights and key enablers so that they can save fuel, optimize battery charging, get uptime, coach drivers for safe driving, and more. And in the past couple of years, our customers, well, they have confirmed that we have a strong legitimacy in this space. They've entrusted us with more than 1.2 million vehicles under contract. And it's that legitimacy that drove us to start regrouping our connected services to fleets from Saskar, Nextrack, and Masternote under one single brand, which is Michelin Connected Fleet. All right. So we, we obviously understand this uh, legitimacy, which is obviously based on your rich history. So let's talk business. So how does this legitimacy now translate into growth? Well, Asha, I have to say that since our last Capital Markets Day, around tires activities have developed pretty well. Uh, two years ago, I told you, if you remember, that we would grow our business from 0.6 billion euro revenue to 0.7 billion revenue by 2023. And today I'm happy to tell you that we have already reached this revenue in 2022. It means one year earlier. Oh, great. We've launched more than 90 service offers last year and Mission Collected Fleets has grown over 10%. And what this actually demonstrates is the fact that the more we develop, the more we crystallize synergies from the acquisitions that we've made over the past few years. We are now able to open new geographies quickly with a low break-even point. Let me take the opening of our South Africa Michelin Connected mm -hmm. Fleets operation, for instance. We combined the digital platform and heavy vehicle offers of Saskar together with the customer support capabilities of Masternode. And six months later, our South African customers were getting 24-7 assistance in English from people in their own time zone. Fantastic. Brilliant. So, Lauren, probably tell us how tires and, and, and service offers generate synergies. Sure. That's a great question. We also have demonstrated synergies with our historical tire business. In Brazil, for example, Michelin sells a multi-energy Z-tire that can mm -hmm. bring truck fleets about 4.5% energy savings thanks to its ro low rolling resistance. 
When we combine that tire with a SASCA offer that delivers typically 4.5% energy savings by helping drivers reduce idle engine time, harsh braking or speeding, our customers can realize more than 9% fuel savings and the equivalent CO2 emissions, while benefiting at the same time from increased safety and improved productivity. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great example of how we combine connected fleet services with high performance tires and tire management and how we create complementary financial, social and ecological value. And it's for all these reasons mm -hmm. that Michelin Connected Fleets is now one of our around tire key business pillars that's growing fast with a run rate EBITDA that will be a credit for the group. Oh, great. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. So maybe, Eric, can you uh, tell us what, what does it require in terms of R&D and data science resources? Yes, absolutely, Asha. Well, alongside the development of connected services to fleets, we're also becoming experts at what we call contextualized mobility data. And let me explain. Uh, because this really is the way that we are going to be able to move to new added value services. Um, thanks to our existing activities and our partnership, we have access to a growing amount of data. And actually, this growth is pretty much exponential. Uh, of course, needless to say, we process all this with high respect for privacy and for confidentiality. Now, after that, our thousands of R&D experts then bring to bear a unique understanding of the interactions between the tires, the road, the vehicles, but also, very importantly, the driver behaviors. And this is what defines the contextualization. It gives us a rare ability to understand the context in which this data has emerged and what it means so that we can derive insights from vehicles and tires. And now in real life, right, how do you intend to use and leverage this ability? Well, the way to do it is what, what we aim at is to build with this expertise a suite of high precision algorithm to address the various specific needs of different drivers. Uh, let, let's look at a few examples, for example. Um, the owners of electric cars, they need to know how fast their tires will wear out, especially on those high torque, high load vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, if I take light commercial vehicles, uh, it's about 20% faster wear rate that you have rather than what you would have on an ICE uh, vehicle. But it also varies very greatly according to driving styles, to usage factors, and, and things such as loading, for example, which has a big impact. So for their safety, it, it's imperative that drivers have reliable predictive information that tells them when to get their tires checked or even to get them replaced. Now let's take another example, uh, the case of truck fleets. They can make substantial savings with precise insights on the health and the wear status of their tires. Did you realize that truck tires often remove their tires when they have five millimeter or even more remaining tread depths? And that really, that's a shame. It's a shame in terms of cost, right. but it's also a shame in terms mm -hmm. of wasting material, uh, especially because we know that running all the way down to three millimeter is perfectly safe if you have high quality tires. And the impact is big. It represents about 15% tire cost difference that could be saved every year for our customers. Mm -hmm. And in addition, fully exploiting the remaining tread depths, thanks to our algorithm, also allows our customers to sell fuel. Because when you're operating as the tread depths of the tire goes down, the rolling resistance gets better. So you're getting more of the best phase of low rolling resistance of your tire. So it's very advantageous. Now, we have many more of these specific use cases in areas such as mining, airplanes, or metros, where our know-how can make a difference in terms of the bottom line, but also in terms of CO2 reduction and the safety of people. Thank you, Eric. But just very briefly, Lorraine, back to you. We, we, we start hearing a little bit about your water offer, right, of certain types of fleets, maybe some insight on that? Well, you know, Asha, it's in our DNA to be giving people a better way forward. And um, today, many small light commercial vehicle fleets really struggle to transition to clean energies and to keep operating in what we call low emission zones. Which vehicle do you choose? How to finance it? How to make sure that charging infrastructure is available? And seeing these challenges, it became you know, pretty quickly obvious that we could bring them what they miss to transition to zero carbon mobility 
we could bring them a unique and comprehensive mm -hmm. solution. And that's how Water was born less than two years ago in our Michelin incubators. Water brings a unique turnkey solution to electric LCVs that need the combination of an electric vehicle, a financing solution, and a bundle of services. And these services, they range from advising fleet managers on which technology suits best, suits best which vehicle, mm -hmm. sorry, to how to access a network of fully qualified charging stations. Our promise basically is that no vehicle ever runs out of battery, thus minimizing <laughs> costs and downtime. Our competitive differentiation is linked to the fact that Watea can leverage many of the Michelin Group assets, um, efficient tires, but also a strong service networks with operational boots on the ground, top-notch telematics capabilities, and a fine understanding of hydrogen stacks. Mm -hmm. um, another thing we work on is battery range prediction. Today, van drivers, well, they rely on range predictions that are often very inaccurate. And it's not surprising, given that the range of a battery can be divided by two, right. depending on criteria such as road gradient, temperature, driving style load, and even simple things like how the battery is charged. Our water algorithm today has already a much better accuracy on mm -hmm. range prediction than the vehicle native signal. And the good thing is that the prediction improves day after day and vehicle after vehicle. It's this differentiation that has enabled Water to capture 10% market share in the high growth segment of electric last mile delivery in France. Good. And it's convinced the French bank Credit Agricole to take a 30% equity stake in the company to support their ambitions in sustainable mobility. And uh, I believe that this is just the beginning of a thrilling business journey. Um, Lorraine, uh, I have one more question for you. Just to remind uh, our audience that uh, we'll take a few questions so you can start preparing your questions. But before that, just let's take a quick step back, Lorraine. So how would you qualify today where you stand with your around tires business development and perspectives? Well, I would say that growth and synergies around tires are really getting material and um, our businesses have become central to the global value that Michelin is bringing to our fleet customers. We now leverage a very powerful brand, Michelin Connected Fleets, and we have developed a signature that mixes cutting edge digital capabilities with very operational routes. And this enables us to deliver insights for people we need actionable solutions, not just raw data. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Lorraine. And Eric, so uh, we will we'll take a few questions. So waiting for some of your questions. I also have some questions coming up straight away here. Maybe we'll start with this one. Uh, the around tire business uh, are known to be less capital intensive than tires. Probably could you elaborate on their contribution to the overall value creation? Uh, what, what can you say about that, uh, Lorraine? Sure, absolutely. I would say um, that those businesses, you know, eventually will be um, value accredited for the group. Today, they're already accredited in terms of gross margins. And within our portfolio of activities, we already have some parts that have uh, very strong EBDA. It's the case of our uh, Brazilian connect Michelin connected fleet operations, for example. Um, and our other assets, such as Michelin connected fleets Europe or North America, um, are targeting the same level of margin contribution. Um, when you think about the investment, the capex in these activities, what's very interesting is that uh, it's extremely modular because it's mostly devices. Mm -hmm. So it tends to follow very closely the development of the business uh, with rather short payback. So eventually, um, these businesses will be uh, value equity for the group. Fantastic. Thank you, Lorraine. And I think we have a question coming up from Philip Koenig, Goldman Sachs. Uh, let's listen to him. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, I just have a question. Um, your dealer network must clearly play a role when you when you think about sort of the um, data parts and the, the connection to your customers, and you probably have one of the largest dealer networks and connections out there within the industry. Uh, <clears throat> can you maybe just share a bit how, how, how you leverage that and how you see yourself maybe a bit advantage compared to some competitors who do not have the uh, who do not have that scale? Thank you very much. 
Well, absolutely, Philippe. I think uh, you know, you're spot on. It's true that we have uh, more than 7,000 points of services throughout the world, whether you know, in close partnership or in franchise or fully owned, for example, like it's the case with the Euromaster network. And um, you're right to say that when you develop a round tire, in particular in connected solutions, you need dealer networks for different things. First, you need to get IoTs installed in the vehicles. Um, and so here, obviously, they, pay, they play a strong role. Um, but then, and that's very particular to the positioning of uh, Michelin Connected Fleets, we believe that it's not about insights, not about raw data, it's not about smart insight. It's actually helping the fleets go from insight to actions. Mm. And to go from insight to action, meaning that you have a signal saying, for example, that your uh, tire is slightly deflated, you need to be able to you know, digitally, digitally connect to service providers and then um, route your fleets to trusted partners. Mm -hmm. And that's where we believe that the fact that we have this very large footprint uh, is going to be and is already a very strong advantage for us. Thank you, Lorraine. All right. Um, this question is, is on uh, data collection. So collecting data, what for? Uh, are you able to collect and analyze data from the tire behavior, driving behavior, or road safety that really actually helps you to develop uh, better tires? It does, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Eric, our yeah, specialist. Absolutely, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, so uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, knowing the tire has a big effect on predicting how the vehicle and the tires are, are going to uh, uh, to behave in in real operation. Uh, if you know your tire, uh, you can and and you know the environment through the data that it's operating in, then you can make very accurate prediction of how fast is it going to wear? Is it affected by the loading that you have? Uh, if you start losing air, how fast is this going to happen? Uh, what is the wear profile gonna go, going to look like? Um, Lauren was talking earlier about the example of calculating the autonomy of your vehicle, of your electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. How long is it going to run? If you know what tire you have, if you have data from the vehicle, you can help project very accurately uh, what's going to, to happen. And, and to do that, you really need to understand the entire uh, functioning of the system, you know, the, the characteristics of the tire, the usage conditions, mm -hmm. and how those two interact, and, and how they you know, function with the vehicle. So it's really having this full view and having, in our case, worked on tire vehicle performance for, for decades that gives us this strong uh, position to be able to develop more meaningful, more uh, relevant uh, algorithms and, and prediction of performance for the good of our customers and, and for the planet. Mm -hmm. Lauren, you want to add something there? Are you good? I think it was perfect. <laughs> and you know, what we hope, and it's one of the mission that we've given our team is to make sure that the better services we deliver, the more data we get, the more data we get, the more, I would say, smart we get in terms of designing tires and services and vice versa. And it becomes a, a virtuous uh, loop that has already started. Fantastic. So thank you to both. Eric, you stay with me still. And uh, Lorraine, thank you very much as we thank welcome you. for the next session, Mode Portigliati Beyond Tires. And we are back, uh, and this time we have Maud Portiati, who is in charge of high-tech materials business. Maud, it's great to have you. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Esha. Fantastic. So uh, we, we heard a lot uh, earlier, so we understood the rationale behind Michelin's ambition around tires. Mm -hmm. But high-tech materials look quite further away from the group's core business. So how should we read you know, this area of growth? Are we talking about diversification? Oh, to be short, the answer <laughs> to your question is no. Okay. <laughs> we are not diversifying, but we are growing by adjacency. As a matter of fact, Michelin is just leveraging its distinctive capability to combine materials in order to create game-changing products in other markets. And this know-how has been developed and applied to tires for more than 130 years. And the good news is that we are now perfectly positioned to valorize it beyond tires. All right, so probably, could you be more specific about your ambition? Maybe explain how you plan to provide better visibility and the performance of these businesses. Oh yes, as you know, by 2030, 
Michelin wants to have a significant part of its revenue around and beyond tires, with the ambition to reach 20 to 30 percent of the group's revenue. And Florent explained earlier that this business development will further reinforce the group's resilience and at the same time accelerate its growth and improve its margin and valuation. Mm -hmm. In the first place, Michelin resilience will increase through an exposition to targeted, high-value, fast-growing and sustainable markets. Sustainable because they rely on long-term trends and doing so, we will become less dependent on cyclical businesses and amplify our non-purely automotive activities. In terms of growth, part of it will come from the organic development of our businesses. In 2022, they already grew by more than 20%. Another part will result from a dynamic m and strategy. And since 2018, we have become quite experienced at targeting, acquiring, integrating and valorizing companies thanks to our deep innovation impact. I'm talking about business performance now. Visibility is limited today, as Beyond Tire's revenue is below 5% mm -hmm. of group sales. But as soon as it, as it becomes material, we will structure a dedicated fourth segment. Great. So this is good to hear. So uh, at this stage, probably we could come back for a second uh, to speak about the differentiation, really explain uh, which types of business are you really talking about? Yes, sure. I've brought my samples. <laughs> <laughs> so in simple words, our strategic asset is our ability to bring to market innovations, combining materials into solutions for very, very demanding applications. Based on this, we have designed a portfolio of businesses structured by families of unique products or components serving many high-value markets. This portfolio is made of two main areas. First, there is the domain of flexible composite products, actually close to the tire, which are macroscopic objects combining rubber and polymer coatings with various textile and metallic reinforcements. This domain includes conveyors, belts, hoses, coated fabrics, mm -hmm. inflatable structures for AN applications in general industry, aerospace, energy, agriculture, foods. And we are already very active in this domain based on the business acquired from Fener, some Bolton acquisition, mm -hmm. and the French startup Air Captif. Second is the domain of the technical materials based on engineered polymers. We are able to design engineered polymers and compounds for tires through the arrangement of different polymer phases and fillers at a very microscopic scale. And this expertise can, both tra can be transposed to high-value engineered polymers in various fields, formulated adhesives and resin, polymeric and textile materials for medical application, and active membranes for energy as an example. All right, so you came with the samples, that's great. So thank you, Maud. Maybe, uh, I, I think, Eric, uh, what, what I understood, you correct me if I'm wrong, so there's this mastery of materials associated also with the, the, the ability to industrialize it at large scale. So what, do you have a secret recipe? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, great recipes are very hard to master, but uh, they can be easy to explain. That, that's, that's a case here. <laughs> Uh, really what sets us apart in that regard is, is our ability to truly innovate by orchestrating very different expertise altogether. In the high technology materials, in industrial processes, and in product design, and to do it while leveraging cutting edge simulation and measurement techniques. Mm -hmm. Our simulation and measurement capabilities are very essential. They span all the way from the molecular level, the, the very fine description of matter, all the way to the characterization of the finished product operating in the field. And because we have this whole chain uh, from the elementary to, uh, to the final product, this allows us to identify and select the material properties that are most attuned to the specific conditions that are encountered in real usage. Now, I also talked about process, and, mm -hmm. and process knowledge, for its part, allows us to integrate the scalability and the mastery of the most critical material transformation mechanisms that happen when you're actually making the tire during the manufacturing phase. 
Uh, and and the, you know, if you look at this product, process, material, and modeling, the greater the number of these expertise are at play simultaneously in order to create differentiation, the closest we are to fully activating our core capabilities. Great, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Maybe, Maud, some concrete examples, if, uh, if you may, that illustrate really how you create a competitive advantage and establish your position in high-tech materials, both organic and external growth. Of course. So since 2018, the activities acquired from Fener around belting, conveyors, coated fabric, sealing have been integrated into the Michelin ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And in line with our ambition to boost their organic growth, concrete application of the technical synergies between Michelin research capabilities and belting activities are already turning into market opportunities. Let us take an example, <laughs> another sample, yeah, another <laughs> one, in the world of conveyors for distribution centers. We have leveraged some tire technologies to introduce a new product replacing the O-rings, and that's a revolution. It delivers four times greater roller-to-roller -roller power transfer without tension decay over the life of the belt. And this allows for a conveyor design that can carry more with less motors, which translates to cost savings in belting, maintenance, and energy. Mm, great. And, yes. <laughs> and Michelin has also sustained a very dynamic roadmap of inorganic growth through selected Bolton acquisitions, such as Fabricot in 2020, a producer of rubber coated fabrics for aerospace application, Lumsden in 2021, or CPS in 2022. All right, so that was for flexible composites. Now, what about engineered polymers? Uh, well, for engineered polymers, let us take Solesis as an example okay. of our achievements. In engineered polymers, Solesis was the medical branch of Fener when acquired by Michelin in 2018. And in 2021, we decided to open part of its capital to Altaris, Altaris being a private equity specialized in healthcare. This strategy was designed to accelerate Solesis development in cardiologic implant, drug release, and cell and gene therapy markets. Altaris provides a broad access to healthcare specialists and fosters the inorganic growth of Solesis. For example, this led to Solesis announcing end of 2022 the acquisition of Polyzen. Mm -hmm. Polyzen is a leading developer and manufacturer of polymer-based film and coating technologies for the medical device and biopharmaceutical industries. And now, talking valuation, mm -hmm. when Michelin acquired Fener for $1.7 billion, Solesis accounted for 8% of its revenue. And only three years down the road, Solesis was valued at $475 million. In a nutshell, Solesis illustrates our ability to actively manage our m and portfolio, both aligning with the right partners and crystallizing the value along the way. All right, so thank you. So on, on top of your partnership with Ataris, I have in mind that you manage an R&D agreement with Solesis. So Eric, probably give us a sense of what it means and what it's about and actually uh, what synergies were you able to achieve? Yeah, you're absolutely uh, right, Asha. In parallel of our equity partnership, a research and development agreement has been signed between mm -hmm. Solesis and Michelin in order to continue the development of biocompatible and bioresorbable uh, polymers. And, and clear synergies have emerged from this association of, of Solesis expertise in biology healthcare applications, together with Michelin mastery of polymer science. Uh, Michelin capabilities in molecular modeling and physical chemical analysis, like the simulation aspects that I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier, uh, have been applied with multiple benefits. Uh, first of all, the use of simulation allows us for reducing the validation time for a new polymer implant technology. And, and we think that's going to be by up to 50%. So very significant uh, gains from having that understanding and that modeling and testing capability. Uh, secondly, the physical chemical analysis of drug delivery mechanisms and our ability to design polymer structures uh, is helping identify very innovative biomaterials pathways 
uh, which really have the potential to significantly increase drug release efficiency and efficacy over time. And finally, our knowledge of polymerization process, again, we go back to the process dimension, it is used to facilitate the scalability of new versions of solicis biopolymers. And that can allow us to achieve shorter synthesis time and very, very importantly, reduce variability. At the same time, it actually goes both ways. Solis' advanced expertise in biology is also helping Michelin deepen its understanding of biocompatible materials, a very important domain, uh, you must admit, on our journey towards 100% of sustainable materials. Fantastic. So the, the mission science goes way beyond what one might think. So let's probably move to another area uh, mode where the group is involved, uh, which is hydrogen mobility. Mm -hmm. So what are the updates on this front? Yes. So since the launch of our joint venture Symbio in 2019, it has gone through a very rapid technical and industrial expansion. A broad portfolio of fuel cell system of various power is under development, and Symbio has a strong customer's pipeline, including Stellantis for their first hydrogen light commercial vehicles, mm -hmm. Safra and GCK for heavy vehicles, and Gosin for logistic transportation. In June 2022, Symbio and Scheffler created Innoplate, a joint venture located in France and dedicated to produce fuel cell bipolar plates, a strategic component. In parallel, Symbio is building its world-class factory in Saint-Fond, France, and this flagship is the one of the biggest fuel cell factory in Europe. It will start producing in six months from now and reach 50,000 systems annually by 2026. Symbio leadership has also been recognized by very significant funding from France and Europe, and this will fast forward Symbio's industrialization while bringing its total manufacturing capacity to 100,000 systems per year. It will enable the creation of 1,000 jobs and contribute to the building of a strong hydrogen ecosystem in Europe. And finally, as you might know, we are under exclusive negotiations with Stellantis for an equity partnership. The arrival of, in Symbio's capital of such a pioneer and frontrunner front runner, in hydrogen mobility mm -hmm. will catalyze the tremendous industrial momentum that has already been built. All right, that's great to hear. We will take a few questions. Uh, for, I hope you have questions for Eric and Maud. But before that, maybe, Maud, if you have a final comment before we take a few of them. Well, okay. If people were to bear in mind only one thing, it is that over the f last few years, we have demonstrated our ability to select and nurture promising organic initiatives and to integrate carefully chosen acquisitions. And today, Michelin High Tech Materials is on track toward the leadership position in businesses that are very, very consistent with our DNA. Great. And I think we have questions coming up. Uh, the question comes this time from Deutsche Bank. Uh, Christoph uh, Laskawi, let's listen to him. Hey, um, two questions, if I may, uh, for the non tire business. The first one on Symbio, you have highlighted that Stellantis is um, looking to buy into the business. Is there a risk that you have in the end an exclusivity with Stellantis for the passenger, uh, passenger car side of the business, or are you still willing and allowed if they buy in to um, supply other OEMs outside of the Stellantis group? And then the second question will be uh, just in general on the non tire business um, and versus the plans that you have initiated in the previous CMD. Did the inflation and the macro environment over the last um, years change the end markets dramatically in any way? Um, to accelerate or actually um, risk the development that you foresee until 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. So for the first question, I would say uh, we don't envision to restrict Symbio to Stellantis business at all. Mm -hmm. Stellantis themselves, they are interested in a very broad Symbio, able to serve not only automotive, light commercial vehicle, but also heavy trucks or even of the road vehicle. So no exclusivity at all. This is an equity partnership that aims at 
I would say, boosting Symbio, but without any exclusivity. That's very important because right. uh, it's, it's a big market in front of Symbio. So for the second question... Yeah, on the macroeconomic uh, yeah. environment. Yeah, I would say that the two last years, in fact, reinforced the vision we had of the high-tech materials. We saw, and we, we saw that with the activity we have, that those markets are very resilient, plus they are very diverse. And uh, for example, we grew over 25% in 2022, 2022 compared to 2021. So really, the last trends mm -hmm. uh, we saw in the market reinforced the vision we had, and we are uh, very motivated for the future without any change of our strategy. All right, so I hope that answers the question. We take the next one coming from Pierre-Yves uh, Keminer, Stiffel. Yes, good afternoon. Thanks for taking that question. Pierre uh, with us, Stiefel. Um, just to have a, a rough idea, uh, you said that uh, <coughs> the high tech business was less than 5% of uh, the group's sales. Are you around 1.2, 1.3 billion in sales at the end of 2022? And as a follow up, um, regarding the profitability of that business, are you accretive to uh, Michelin overall um, margin at the EB level? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So end of 2022, we were at 1.1 billion sales. Mm -hmm. So very close what that, uh, from what was announced for 2023 during our capital market days in 21. So yeah, we are around those uh, four to five percent. And profitability wise, we are very close to the SR3 profitability. Typically, the EBIT margin of the business we are speaking about are around 15 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's accretive for the group, and it is meant to be accretive for the group in the future. Thank you, Maud. Uh, next question coming from Michael Jacks, Bank of America. Taking my question, it's actually a follow-up from the first question from Christoph, and maybe just asked another way. We've seen that OEMs tend to be quite cautious um, when awarding business to suppliers that have competing OEMs as shareholders, particularly in Japan with the with the Keiretsu suppliers. Um, my question is, what sort of assurances could you provide to these um, competing OEMs to make them comfortable enough to to award business to uh, Symbio? Thank you. Well, uh, you know, in this hydrogen mobility, uh, this is a world of alliance, for sure. And now, you know, uh, Stellantis being a shareholder of Symbio won't have access to the market, to the information of the customers. It is under discussion right now, the governance of the, of the future JV. So really, we will provide this insurance that Stellantis will be only a, a shareholder and no information will be shared to Stellantis regarding the other customers. Mm -hmm. And you know, as I said, for example, for truck, heavy truck, this is not in the where to play of Stellantis today and it will be a huge opportunity for Symbio. All right. Okay, maybe we have time, just one final question and we take it from Sanjay Bhagwani from City. Hi, uh, th thank you very much for taking my question as also. Just coming back on Symbio, I, I think in June last year, you also announced this uh, joint venture between Symbio and uh, Schaeffler called Inoplate. And I suppose the purpose of that JV is also to produce the bipolar plates uh, for, for the hydrogen solutions. And, and I think in Symbio also today, you mentioned that it's going to be making bipolar plates. So, so could you please maybe explain the difference between uh, these two businesses? And uh, probably Symbio includes much broader set of components. Is that right? Yes, of course. Thank you, Sanjay. So the bipolar plate is very a key component for the fuel cell. And Symbio's strategy is to be as integrated as possible vertically because it will be a, a key differentiator compared to the, the Symbio competitors. So Symbio wants to be integrated in bipolar uh, plate, and they also want to be integrated in what we call MEA, that is the heart of the fuel cell. So for bipolar plate, we decided to share the investment with Scheffler, 
And this is a production GV that will produce only for Symbio and for Scheffler. And for MEA, we decided to directly integrate this activity into Symbio. So no competition uh, here. It's only a way to integrate while sharing the cost of this integration with Scheffler. Great. Brilliant. I think that's all the time we have for this session. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you, Eric and Maud. As we move to our final session, the conclusion, and we take a few questions after that uh, with Eve and Florent. And we are back on the set, uh, joining me again, Yves and Florence. So it has been lots of information here and lots of interesting questions here. So we've learned a lot about the group's activities with the different business lines. So now, Eve, maybe we start with this first question. So we understood uh, the business strategy of many of the group achievements since your last uh, Capital Markets Day in 2021, uh, two years ago. Now, what about the financials against the ambitions that you presented back then? So can you tell us a few words about that? I will. <laughs> well, thank you, Asha. Well, at our 2021 uh, Capital Market Day, we committed on four KPIs toward 2023. Of course, much more beyond for 2030, but for 2023, four KPIs, sales, segment operating income, free cash flow, and return on capital employee. Regarding sales in April 2021, we expected to go back to 2019 level by the second half of 2022 with we assume at that time, 2023 being the first normal year in the post-COVID uh, mm -hmm. environment, uh, reaching sales around 24 billion euros. It went completely another way since we reported sales of 28.6 billion euros in uh, 2022, despite volumes down by 6% versus 2019. This sharp revenue increase was mainly driven by substantial price hikes, to offset the 3.9 billion euro cost that Florent mentioned as inflators uh, that we have uh, to bear during this period, along with the continuous mix and rich enrichment. As far as segment operating income is uh, concerned, we committed to deliver a segment operating income in 2023 of 3.3 billion euro at January 21 exchange rates. 2022 was actually already at 3.4 billion euros, supported by our price discipline, a richer mix, competitiveness measures regarding industrial footprint, manufacturing processes, SGNA, and the contribution from our non-tire businesses. Mm -hmm. Maybe a word on operating margin in percentage. In a very inflationary period that we already known, we still to protect our margin in euro per unit not in percentage of sales. Over 2021 and 2022, inflation had a huge dilutive effect on our margin that we estimate of 1.7 points, which means that the 11.9% operating margin of 2022 should be read at 13.6% on a comparable basis. If we restate the, the dilution effect uh, from each uh, the reporting segments, each of them has already reached in 2022, the target that we have set for 2023 at the last CMD. All right, so that answers quite uh, clear the question, but what about cash and return and capital employed? Well, as regards the free cash flow, our goal was over the period, over the four years from 2020 to 2023, to deliver 6.3 billion euros of free cash flow. We actually already deliver 4.2 billion in the first three years, between 2020 and 2022, including a 1 billion euro negative impact of inflation on our working capital in 2022. We have also decided to simplify and guide on reported free cash flow in the future before M&A and no longer on a structural free cash flow. The last major KPI, uh, and probably the most important for me, is the return on capital employed. Here we committed to deliver a return on capital employee of 10.5% starting from 2023, coming from 10% in 2019. In 2022, we posted 10.8% 10 
we are ahead of our target for 2023. All right, Eve, could you probably expand on your policy on shareholder return? Sure. Let's start first with the dividends. We maintain them even in time of crisis. And we have improved recently our proposition of payers ratio to 44% mm -hmm. in 2022, with a plan to gradually increase this payout ratio to 50% towards uh, 2030. On top of dividend, mm -hmm. We stick to a yearly anti-dilutive share buyback programs to offset the impact to employee uh, share plans. All right. And now you often refer uh, to your strategy as leading on those three very key pillars that are people, profit and planet. Now, how would you qualify them? <laughs> You're right. Our strategic core scorecard is made of 12 ambitions split across people, profit and planet. We are making strong progress towards our 2030 ambition. And let me mention a few topics. Talking about people, our people-focused ambitions, we are encouraged by the level of engagement of our employees. Look at our 2022 global survey fulfilled by over 106,000 employees. Whereas we are getting out of three totally abnormal years uh, in terms of environment, mm -hmm. 88% of them expressed they were proud to be part of Michelin. And the engagement rate has increased by three points versus 2021, reaching 83%. People commitment and trust in the company and in the future, these are our main reason to believe that we are going to succeed in our ambition. <laughs> All right. And uh, maybe um, when, when I listen to uh, the different uh, members of the executive committee earlier. So understand that part of your growth actually will be achieved through M&A. So what can you share with us, uh, you know, to give uh, the investors who are watching us, to give them confidence in your ability to achieve such an ambitious M&A plan? So in, in merger and acquisition, we are mainly talking around, about around and beyond tire businesses, which we plan to grow up to 20 to 30 percent of group sales by 2030. Over the past five years, we have been able to design various M&A patterns mm -hmm. to support our strategy. We have been very agile in managing our portfolio in and out, and Maud or Lorraine have given several examples, uh, to ensure the best strategic fit and capital allocation. Basically, we have three main approach regarding M&A. First, we will own 100% of the capital that when we want to internalize the know-how of the targets and its market access. The objective there is to foster the value mm -hmm. of the whole company by leveraging our own distinctive capabilities around material science, product design, or industrial processes. Just a word on synergies. It is important for investors to understand that beyond the cost synergies that we are committed to deliver and extract within the first two years, the main stake for us is to reach deep innovation synergies, which are very powerful, but actually materialize from the year three onwards. Mm -hmm. This is a kind of synergy more described earlier when talking about the O-Rings light belt commercialized by Fener. In summary, when we buy out a company, we chase mid to long-term synergies, which materialize through product mix enrichment dedicated to high-end product on fast-growing and highly profitable niches. And you mentioned various M&A patterns, I mean, apart from full acquisitions. So can you expand? So there is the <laughs> other two. Bon, first, we, and it's quite new for Michelin, in the past five years, we have opened several joint ventures at 50-50 or, or close to that. Mm -hmm. well, we'll mention the example of Solesis, our medical business, when we opened up the capital to Altaris, uh, which is a private equity, a US-based private equity specialized in healthcare. Here, the purpose were, was really to speed up Solesis growth mm -hmm. by leveraging Altaris intimacy with the sector while keeping strong ties with the company through an R&D agreement that has been described by Eric previously. Mm -hmm. 
And finally, we may take a minority stake in selected company or startup. For instance, when we want to partner on innovation in an asset light manner, illustrations are Carbio, so Enviro, on sustainable materials, where we do not wish to finance or operate the entire, the, the whole business model, but where we claim valuable IP related to material science and process. Mm -hmm. So there's some kind of M&A agility that fits the strategy. So, but in practice, tell us about your uh, track record in this field. So actually, our M&A uh, track record over the past five years is quite impressive. And this gives us confidence in our ability to pursue our strategy. We have demonstrated that uh, Michelin is good at integrating acquire companies from both a cultural and a managerial standpoint. We have also shown our ability to assess synergies prior to a deal, then to achieve them. Mm -hmm. And let me give you an example in 2022, the bottom line impact of Fener, Camso, and Multistrada synergies reached 145 million euros, right in line with our plan. On top of that, we have demonstrated our ability to scale up businesses um, embedded in the company or acquire, or to ally with the right partners by selecting the right M&A pattern and improving the group return on capital employee. Mm -hmm. Last but not <laughs> least, in around and beyond tire business, we are now getting the expected value of these deep innovation synergies delivered thanks to several breakthroughs in R&D, industrial process innovation, and new data intelligence capabilities. Right, thank you, Eve. So, Florent, so we heard, we've heard a lot, uh, we shared a lot of facts and figures and lots of information, and it seems that you're quite on track uh, to achieve your 2023 targets, but not just that, but also the 2030 ambitions. So, are there lots of people watching us today? What would you like them to keep in mind about uh, Michelin, about the group? Well, Asha, my first message today is that despite a very challenging environment, a uh, very challenging and uncertain environment that we have experienced over the past two years, we have delivered a high performance. These achievements not only give us confidence in our ability to navigate the new trends that are developing around the world, but they demonstrate the relevance of our strategy. Where some see threats and constraints in these challenging circumstances, we at Michelin decide to see opportunities. We are convinced that our differentiation will be and will become more and more recognized. And uh, speaking of our differentiation, so I think it's really the innovation capabilities that seems to be the common denominator that feeds all your activities. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> so yes, um, it is clearly visible today with the presence of Eric Vines in my place. Uh, for almost all the intervention. Uh, he's our head of R&D, and, and that uh, says a lot about the synergies we want to develop. In all our activities, we leverage technologies that were developed through our presence in the tire space, but that can be applied to many more end markets at a high value premium. Here, I think it is important for our audience to realize Michelin is not just a tire company. Mm -hmm. We've never, be, we've never been so, by the way. <laughs> uh, rather, look at us as a deep tech company able to address many high-end market verticals. And within this framework, we trust that our future success will come from our ability to further improve our tire activities, structural performance on the one hand, and to genuinely manage the markets that we are able to address around and beyond tire on the other hand. That's quite clear. Thank you, Florent. Maybe I uh, will take a few questions in a couple of seconds. Maybe just one last comment before we open the Q&A. Yes, um, the last one would be uh, with Eve. Um, I would like first to thank Scott, Maud, Eric, Lauren for their participation today. They've been um, very uh, explicit and uh, help us understand better our business. And on top of that, I would like to recognize all our Michelin teams uh, who contribute every day to making our Michelin adventure a reality. And for our audience, uh, I'm happy to announce that we will host an in-present Capital Markets Day in 2024, where we will reveal our next medium-term goals towards 2026. 
Oh, exciting. So looking forward to that. Thank you, Floral. Maybe we open the Q&A now and uh, we'll take this first question. And the first question is related really to come back on the planet ambitions. Eve, I think that's your field. Yeah. So coming to the planet ambition, we have a clear roadmap toward uh, our decarbonation and to reduce by 50% uh, by 2030 our CO2 emission. And we have secured the capital expenditure uh, to do so. Scott mentioned the price electrification, uh, for example. Uh, sustainable material is also very important. It has been mentioned uh, uh, by Eric and, and uh, Maud and, and Scott. We are already able, it has been shown, to produce homologated tires at scale with more than 50% of sustainable material. Uh, this shows that we are making strides along with our partners and suppliers. And finally, on top of these KPIs, uh, we have committed on reducing our environmental externalities. And there was here also we, we, beat, we have beaten our ambition. Based on a CO2 reference cost of 120 euro per ton. Today on the European market, the CO2 is at 100 euro per ton. Mm -hmm. We decreased our externalities by nearly 100 million euros since 2019 to 493 million euros, well below our uh, 2023 target. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And we take a question from Thomas Besson, Kepler Chevrolet. Let's listen to him. Uh, thank you very much uh, for taking my questions. Uh, a, a couple, please. Uh, firstly, uh, as you mentioned during the, the various presentation, uh, inflation uh, has been uh, substantially uh, higher than you anticipated when, when you set up the plan, meaning that uh, to get to 20% plus of, of revenues for, for new activities, you're going to uh, have to have substantially higher absolute revenues, uh, meaning you, you, you're going to have to acquire uh, substantially more uh, revenues, probably at a higher cost. Uh, could you make uh, any comments on this and on the uh, average kind of acquisition you, you plan to make in terms of uh, size? Uh, uh, is it going to be a five or ten uh, mid-size acquisitions, or could it be w one big one? That's the first question. Okay, maybe I will take this one. Um, it can be both. We are not looking at uh, different. We are looking at different alternatives to reach our, our target. Uh, but you rightly mentioned the fact that. 20% is more challenging because, of course, with the inflation, our, our revenue has grown, uh, has grown a lot. Um, we're looking, we are investigating many different uh, opportunities uh, right now. And, of course, we are very uh, cautious about um, decisions we make in that, um, when, when it comes to M&A. And, and keep in mind that um, we constantly uh, want to make sure that uh, we deliver on our value creation and our rookie of at least 10.5%. Um, uh, so that's uh, what drives us. And um, it would be um, better describing that, but we, we don't want to, um, ma when making acquisitions, whether small or big, mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to degrade too much our financial uh, ratings. Right. Thank you, Florent. Maybe Eve, if you want to add well, that was very really clear. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Hope it answers your question. We take the next one from Philip Koenig, Goldman Sachs. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I, I just uh, My question is sort of on the, on the capital allocation. Um, I mean, uh, and especially on the CapEx. So um, you mentioned earlier that you see different ways of investing, whether that's sort of a, a clear acquisition or, or, or via JVs. Um, how do you see sort of your, your CapEx evolving as you sort of um, support the JVs via financing and, and CapEx spend over the next couple of years as you, as you aim for those 20 to 30% um, diversification by the end of the decade? Thank you. So first, uh, Philip, CapEx and GV financing are two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our GV needs financing uh, because they are in, uh, in let's say, in scale-up mode. On the other hand, some of our GV are also... Uh, uh, returning us uh, cash, as it happened, for example, for TBC in uh, 2021. Um, regarding the CapEx, uh, we have probably seen three, three periods. Before COVID, we were on a trend of uh, spending around 1.9 billion euro per year. Um, of course, uh, 2020, we have been able to take some harsh decisions 
uh, that has some consequences on uh, 2021, and we are really catching up between 2022 and 2023. Uh, that's why we have a slight increase of capex for these two years, uh, let's say beyond, beyond the two billion euro. Looking forward, um, we can. There is at least two things that we can share. The first one is that inflation is not only impacting operating costs; it's also impacting capex. And we have estimation, depending on the category of, uh, let's say, inflationary pressure, of around 15% on the capex in the, in the at least in 2022. And second, we have particularly our uh, sustainability and decarbonation roadmap that will deserve. Uh, probably more investments. Uh, Scott mentioned press electrification. You can imagine that in the current environment of energy prices in Europe, uh, we are looking at uh, maybe accelerating uh, our uh, investments because first, these investments at a certain level of electricity or gas price are uh, extremely uh, profitable. They are uh, generating a good payback. Uh, and on top of that, they are necessary on our roadmap toward uh, uh, zero emission by 2050. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Yves. Uh, the next one coming from Steve Pereiras, Société Générale. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I just want to know a bit more about Beyond Tires. So are you happy with the current vertical view in? And is it more growth coming from expanding within those existing verticals, like conveyor belts, hoses, etc., and what proportion of growth is, is being fueled by entering new new verticals? Thanks. I'm not sure we didn't capture the, the end of the, the question. Just, just the, the end of the question, maybe, Steve, if you could repeat that, the connection was not very clear. Apologies for that. Um, the question really is, is growth in beyond tires being fueled by entering new verticals or is it by gaining existing, uh, gaining more customers within existing verticals like conveyor belts and houses, oh. etc.? It, it, again, it's both. Um, we are looking into um, um, new um, verticals. Uh, and new type of customers within these verticals. Mm -hmm. So we are looking in both directions. All right. But if I can complete, we are looking, and I think more than Eric has explained it, we are looking at verticals where, thanks to our material science, our process uh, knowledge, we can improve the performance of the product of the company we acquire in order either to make them extract more value or uh, acquire more market share in their respective uh, domain. Mm -hmm. the, the little belt that was um, shown yeah, by, uh, by Mode is the perfect exa example of that. It looks like a belt, but it's actually a revolution in the belting of uh, conveyor, um, conveyors for Amazon of this world, etc. It is a real re revolution. Thank you to both. Next question, Bank of America, Michael Jax. Hi, thanks for taking another question. Um, I have one follow-up question and then another question. The first one is just to clarify. Thank you for sharing the synergy extraction number for Fenno, Cams, and Multistrata. I just wanted to clarify, is the 145 million euro number that you mentioned a revenue or operating profit equivalent? Um, and then my second question is just more in broad terms on the M&A strategy. How do you think about managing the increased organizational complexity that comes with um, the diversification path that Michelin is on, particularly in terms of management time and focus? And are you at all worried that this path could potentially see Michelin become more of a conglomerate structure um, in the future? Thank you. So the synergies maybe... Yeah, the, the synergies, the 145 million is a 145 million on the net results after tax for the company. And for uh, managing the complexity, we've been preparing ourselves for um, a long time now. And um, um, we, we realize there is going to be complexity. Um, our tire business is very integrated. The way we manage um, these new businesses around and beyond tires is very different. Um, where we have, um, we have more, uh, more entities with uh, more autonomy. Um, we have also, when we make acquisitions, 
we also require very talented people as well. And if you look at uh, Fener, um, all the managers that were in charge of those businesses, the five businesses of Fener at that time, are still in charge. And um, uh, very like, likewise in, uh, in Camso and in various businesses, we also acquire talents. So um, uh, now, the bulk, is, it's not, we're not becoming a conglomerate because again, um, Maud was mentioning it uh, several times, we're looking at adjacencies to our core know-how, and Eric uh, was mentioning what is our core know-how, whether it's on macroscopic level or macroscopic level, mm -hmm. we have a deep understanding of uh, polymers, and uh, we are deep tech companies, engineering um, our knowledge of usage using leveraging technology, or uh, we are developing a new platform for um, uh, polymers in different formats. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we take a follow-up question from Thomas Besson, Kepler Chauveur. Thanks, uh, I actually have two follow-up questions. I'll ask them right now because this way I'm sure I can ask them. Uh, first, uh, CapEx, I mean, I understand uh, that CapEx is higher uh, in 23-24 uh, because it was lower in previous years. Uh, can you just give us an idea uh, on whether it, it drops after 24? or whether it stays at 22, 23 levels, or eventually even goes up, depending on the, the timing of acquisitions. Uh, and then uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, come back to the creation of a SR4, uh, eventually at one point once you've made this acquisition. Do you view that as a value creative mode? Do you think it's going to help the market better assess what you're doing with it, and therefore uh, lift eventually your multiple? Or uh, maybe to follow up with uh, Mike Michael just was saying, uh, is there not a risk that financially you're perceived as a conglomerate? Uh, because for the time being, despite the success of your acquisitions, your multiples have decreased rather than increased. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the, the CapEx, there is, well, you, we can assume that they will probably uh, stay uh, stable for the, the years to come. Uh, so take 2023 as, a, let's say, as a basis. Um, because again, if we want to accelerate uh, our decarbonization roadmap mm -hmm. uh, and to cope with the, uh, the local to local strategy with the, in a world that is becoming more and more fragmented uh, we, we make to make sure that uh, we have the right uh, capacity where our customers are based. Uh, to come back on the creation of SR4 uh, we are sticking to IRFRS uh, standards uh, so we need to have an activity which is represent at least 10% of the group uh, sales, so we are not yet now. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I would like to, to mention maybe three things. First, we start to disclose some data about non-tire activity through the uh, uh, bridges that we are publishing every semester, where you see clearly the contribution of non-tire business, both on our sales right. and our operating margin. Second, SR4 has not to purpose, of purpose to uh, uh, make a sort of sum of the part because it is the contrary. We are not a conglomerate. Mm -hmm. A conglomerate is a company which is managing different business only on financials. And, and, yeah. and he, he was speaking about the risk of being perceived yeah. as one. Yeah. But uh, I think that was the purpose of today's <laughs> presentation and uh, the presence of Eric during the, 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 the free uh, presentation in tires around and beyond show that there is a, a glue or a, let's say something that is connecting uh, very closely all mm -hmm. these businesses. So what we expect is that, that investors, while also seeing continuous improvement in the tire business, will see that the group is able to create value beyond, beyond tires, tires and around tires. Mm -hmm. The Solesis deal was an example and there will be some probably other examples in the months or years to come. And the creation of an SR4, when we will be ready, uh, should be the demonstration that we are able to create value beyond tires. Um, maybe I just want to stress this yes. last point um, mentioned by Yves. When we incubate businesses, they carry, when, as soon as they go out, they carry a lot of value. So the issue is the multiples that we are ranked in are wrong. <laughs> It's not because our business is wrong. It's, it's, it's the way we are appreciated. But when we see solesis, but we have other examples where when the business 
uh, is valued in, either in a joint venture or uh, elsewhere, it, it has very high multiples when it exceeds the added value that Mishnah has brought to that business. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a couple of more minutes. Next question, Pierre-Yves uh, Kemener from Stifol. Hey, th thanks again um, for taking my question. This is Pierre-Yves um, with Stifol. Um, three quick ones, please, um, to, to, to better couch the, uh, the capital allocation. The, the first one, um, if we aggregate both the CapEx spending, which should be roughly stable around the 2023 levels of 2.3 billion roughly, and the funding to JVs, how much should we con consider uh, Michelin to spend going forward? That would be the first question. Second one is regarding um, the future M&A. Um, what's your maximum firepower then if you, if you were to make a, a big one, a big acquisition in, in one go uh, without any uh, new equity measure? And the last one would be on the payout ratio uh, going forward. In 2021, you said you were contemplating a 50% uh, payout ratio starting in 2021. Uh, um, how should we think about the payout ratio going forward starting uh, on, the, um, uh, on the earnings of 2023? Many thanks. Okay. Three questions there. Okay. Who wants to start? <laughs> okay. I will start. So, um, for, for your information, the GV uh, uh, spending, if we look in average over the past years, was in average for the group around 50 million. So it's uh, uh, not a huge amount of money because these are GV, so we have partners who are contributing equally uh, to the financial needs of this company. And on top of that, as I mentioned, there is some GV that are, uh, let's say, returning back uh, cash to, to, the, to the company. Um, regarding future M&A, uh, bon, if, if I follow uh, the, uh, if I look, for example, at, uh, at our rating, our financial rating, we are currently uh, A minus. If I take uh, Standard and Poor's, uh, without degrading substantially our rating, uh, we can probably make acquisition, let's say, beyond five billion euro. If if there was an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there is an opportunity, but if there was if an opportunity... If you could, it would yeah. be... Beyond. So, uh, but that's that the, 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 the maximum firepower, so it's probably beyond, beyond 5 billion, mm -hmm. without impacting our current rating. And if we were accepting, uh, let's say, a one-notch downgrade, you can probably add a, a few couples of, uh, of a billion euros. But that's, I mean, that's not the... the the key question for us, the question is, are we able to create value and maintain or improve the rocky of the group uh, with doing that? Regarding the payout ratio, uh, in fact, maybe there was a, a, a misunderstanding or, uh, on our side. Um, our intention is to reach 50%. We have also to take in account the progression of our net results and uh, to have also a reasonable and uh, gradual smooth uh, dividend increase in a framework uh, where we have also to look at the remuneration of the other stakeholders. Uh, and that's the kind of discussion we have with Florent, with our supervisory board, when we discuss about uh, uh, the, the proposition of the dividend we'll submit to the shareholders meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Um, next question, Himanshu Agarwal from Jeffries. Thanks for taking my questions, Himanshu from Jeffries. Uh, sorry, coming back to the m and just wanted to ask, so do you, at this stage, do you have any um, regional focus? Are you looking at Europe, North America, or Asia? And in terms of the m and um, what is your preference? Is it like several small acquisitions or one a big m and uh, Which do you think is uh, easier to integrate? And, and lastly, um, are you looking at like um, an acquisition, something to complement, like, something in the same space as Fenner, or are you looking at more from a software angle? Uh, yeah, if you can just give us some more details. Thank you. Okay. okay um, thank you. Thank you for the, the, um, those three questions. Um, our m and scope is um, for around and beyond tires. Of course, there is, um, in beyond tires, we are addressing potentially a market of $300 billion. Uh, so 
there is many more potential than around tires because in around tires we want, as explained by uh, Lorraine, we, we, we play on the field where we add value. And we don't add value everywhere uh, around tires leveraging technology. So um, that limits a, lit a little bit the, uh, our, our scope. Our preference is we don't have a preference. The, the, both journeys are investigated. Uh, bigger acquisitions are uh, a series of small acquisitions. Mm -hmm. uh, we would look at opportunities. Always rem let's, uh, we always remind ourselves that um, in order to make an acquisition in, in, in front of a buyer, and we are potentially a buyer, you have to have a seller. And we have to agree <laughs> on the price. So, uh, which some, sometimes it's, it's... You have all the combinations. It, the combination is, is uh, that's when you can conclude the m and <laughs> so, so that's why we're pursuing uh, both journeys at the same time. And whether in, in terms of regional focus, what we see is um, in China, businesses are very expensive extremely expensive and it's difficult to assess uh, reali the reality of uh, our understanding of those businesses. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, in, if I look at Beyond Tires, um, uh, in uh, microscopic and micro microscopic um, fields that uh, mentioned by Mood, um, Western Europe, North America are probably um, the fields where we are looking more. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of regional in terms of focus. geographies, yes. yeah. And uh, I think that's it. Was there a follow-up oh, question? There was a question about yeah, the, the Fenner-like of yeah. software-like. Yeah, more that, That's what I said. It's, it's, uh, around yeah. tires, it will be more software-like. And, mm -hmm. and, it, it, uh, and if it's uh, beyond tires, it will be more Fenner-like. Okay. And I we will grow in both areas. Okay, but great. To a more, more in beyond tires than in around tires. Okay, and we take a question. We have Philip Koenig in it from Goldman Sachs. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just just one uh, follow-up question, and maybe maybe switching it a bit around. Um, you know, in order to reach your your diversification target of twenty to thirty percent, would you also consider any disposals, maybe within the tire business, to to reach your diversification strategy early on? Is that nothing that you currently have on your mind? Thank you very much. Um. um uh, Eve mentioned the, at the beginning that uh, we are constantly managing our, in an active ma manner our portfolio. So we have done some, we have sold some business and we have acquired some businesses. Um, in the tire space, selling will be more difficult because in the tire space it's a very integrated business. Um, so selling in that uh, space will be uh, more difficult. But mm -hmm. if we have opportunities and it makes sense strategically, we we, we are we have no uh, issue at selling uh, businesses if uh, if it makes sense strategically. Thank you, Florent. A couple of more minutes. Uh, next question coming this time from Thomas Besson. Capler Chevrolet. Thank you. I have a, another follow-up, please. Uh, if the market doesn't value your, your stock properly, uh, would you at one point consider spinning off uh, part of uh, your assets the, the way uh, Daimler separated uh, its truck activities or uh, the way uh, uh, Fiat in the past uh, separated uh, Ferrari? Uh, I know it would uh, uh, put the, the target of 20 to 30% uh, uh, somewhere else, mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of value creation, uh, is that uh, an option if, uh, say, in five years' time, you have acquired uh, something and the market still doesn't uh, see it the same way than you do? Um, I think in your question, you've uh, almost answered, because um, if we do not succeed in re-rating Michelin through this, um, then we will consider any other avenue. Um, uh, to, to make sure that uh, those businesses are valorized and we are not impaired in our growth strategy because of valuations. Mm -hmm. uh, so our balance sheet today is strong enough so that we can make um, one or several moves and, and um, in, for the near future. But uh, again, we will we'll be looking at um, various opportunities. When I look at uh, what we have done on hydrogen, for example, or when uh, um, I look at what we have done with Solesis, Things are very open in the way mm -hmm. then uh, those businesses can be uh, valorized uh, financially after that. Right. Uh, five more minutes. Uh, next question, Steve Pereira, Société Générale. 
Hi there, thank you for taking uh, just, just one more question from my side. Um, how do you think about geopolitical risk? And can you maybe give us an update on your local to local strategy? Geopolitical risk. Um, so, on geopolitical uh, risk, um, it is true that um, I was mentioning in my inflection um, the world's fragmentation. Mm -hmm. It's new. Uh, we've clearly exited uh, since the uh, events in uh, Ukraine. Uh, we've clearly exited um, the happy globalization uh, world. Yeah. And now cool. we are entering into um, a world that um, is somewhat um, could be, could be scary if we're not careful. So our strategy is um, looking at. Um, being as autonomous as possible by region, by major regions. Mm -hmm. So we look at uh, China, we look at uh, the US, we look at uh, Europe, we look at um, South America. So we, we've splitted the world in several regions and we want to be as autonomous as possible by region in our, all our activities. Some of our, um, we, we have, uh, for example, grown some dependency on um, machinery, equipment, uh, from China. So we're looking into that uh, to see how we could um, uh, develop other parts of the world to, uh, for our, our equipment. Not exiting China, but just balancing the risks to make sure that we have a good assessment of revenue and good assessment of our cost by region so that uh, in the event something was moving, um, we, um, we would, uh, the group would not suffer too much. We are truly a global company, mm -hmm. and, and um, out of the CAC 40, uh, we are the most exposed to uh, the entire world. because We are present in 174 countries. So we are very sensitive to this geopolitical uh, um, risk, and we take now, uh, it's on the top of our strategic agenda, to look at how we reshuffle some, uh, marginally some of our businesses, nothing radical, but we are more sensitive now, and we look uh, how we can uh, rebalance things. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, we are very attentive to this, to this mm -hmm. subject. And maybe if you, 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 you're happy with that, you want to answer yeah. something there. I, I think we are, we've reached the end uh, of our time together. Uh, Florent, uh, Yves, thank you very much. Maybe one last word for you, Florent, if you want just to say... Yeah, I thank all the Michelin uh, people, uh, but I forgot to thank you, Asha, for oh, entertaining pleasure. us uh, yeah, thank today. You, it was great, and um, um, really, uh, Michelin is very, very strong in a um, very, very challenging environment. But as we, we have a very optimistic view mm -hmm. uh, of this, we see opportunities in this uh, Mm -hmm. challenging environment. Fantastic. And the next Capital Market Day is next year in person. In person, okay. 2024. So it should be more exciting then. Yeah, provided <laughs> there is no pandemic, a new, okay. no new pandemic. Right. Let's not, let's not uh, use the word pandemic to finish the show, <laughs> right. right? Okay. Thank you very much, Laurent. Thank, thank you, you even thank, thank you, you to all the members of the executive committee who are on the table here. I hope it was insightful for all of you. Thank you for your great questions and uh, see you next year. Goodbye.